why people struggle to commit to personal training to, well, you could even say anything in life, right? But if we yeah, go directly yeah, to personal so training or personal training or like a relationship yeah. or like a workout program or like a diet or some sort, why do people have such a big issue with trying to commit or go through with their intentions, right? Everyone starts 2020 or any year, any right, decade, so they start there and say, hey, this year's going to be different. This thing's going to be different. However, they're sitting now on what, March 13th and nothing's changed. And then they yeah. turn around and they say, oh, it's because of this, 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 and this. It's because I didn't have the money. It's because I didn't have the time. It's because I didn't have the resources. I couldn't, I didn't, you know, left, right, and centered. You know, someone's being mean to me. All of these things, right? We all heard them. But what do you think the underlining issue or cause of this is? Um, so I would say my initial thought would be from a behavioral point of view is everyone, everyone has this idea and, and this one goes across the board. It's like, obviously we all hear of nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? Mm -hmm. We all know that one, we're all happy with it. But the trouble is what that counter conflicts with is the internal mechanism is nothing ventured, nothing lost. I think people are so scared of the of progress because it can, they could go back on themselves. It's not the fear of, of progressing forward they're worried about. It's like, if I can move forward, I can also move back. And moving back terrifies them more mm. than being able to potentially move forward. And I think that's what really makes people freeze and overthink things. It's like, well, I could do really well, but then I could lose it all. So if I'm staying mm. where I am, I'm neither moving or regressing. And they're, they're kind of stuck in this limbo, but limbo's comfortable, I think. Yeah. I think also like if anything we can take about current events of what's happening now is that especially in New Zealand and Australia, we have like what we call KiwiSaver or like a retirement thing that you're, if you're an employee or even uh, even self-employed, you can do this, but employees get a certain percentage based on what you decide three, six and 9% I think of your weekly salary or annual um, pay to go into this account every, every week. And what yeah. happened with the, the current events is people are losing like five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 just overnight. And I think wow. if anything you can take away from that, you can see the panic and, uh, you know, panic and, you know, all these things happening and everyone's going like, oh my God, I can't believe I just lost all my money. But if you can literally learn from it, it's like, well, you put all that money away and it took you, let's say $5,000 took you like half a year to a year to do from your, you know, minimum wage job or, you know, just over minimum wage job. If you take that and say, well, actually, I lost money by doing what I thought was correct and saving all my pennies and putting everything away and putting myself in isolation and, and saying that I'm you know, playing it safe, you just lost $5,000 and it was out of your control. So I feel like so many people conform to what is norm or conform to what has been taught to them by their parents, loved ones and friends that they kind of almost don't have any option and they don't have any fair chance because they're brought up in that environment. Like if you're brought up in a, in a, in a, in a house that is, you know, they don't take any risks. They stay by the, you know, they don't go out and venture. They don't take any financial risks, any emotional risks, any personal risks. Of course, you're not going to do that. So then of course that is a byproduct of going into the gym and going to a personal trainer and, you know, looking at the personal trainer's uh, price versus who he is or who, who she is as an individual and say, well, actually, if I spent $60 a session, I'm probably going to get there faster because it's going to take me four or five times as long. Yeah. So it's coming yeah, back it's, and it, there you go. You yeah, go. I, I get where you're coming from. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because everyone knows the idea of investing in something is the way to move forward. Like we all know mm. that if you want to, to own a house, you have to make payments on it. If you want to buy a car or whatever, or go on a holiday, you have to save up your spending money. And it's really strange how certain things are completely acceptable to invest into and things like that yet when we think of ourselves more so we really tend to lowball it or we we tend to back off or i think the other side is you see you almost assume that it if to, to venture forward is like going forth with reckless abandon i think people think it's if you play safe is one thing but to take a risk all of a sudden you're going to start throwing caution to the wind and like become like these gamblers that fall into massive amounts of debt and stuff because mm. we see things as all or nothing it's like either we don't take any risks or we have to take every single risk ever because mm. that's the only way it's going to work i think we've lost that middle ground i was talking to um uh, and again i think social media plays a part in this because all you see is successful people or unsuccessful people mm. and there's no people that are just doing all right and they're ticking over because they took a little chance and they learned a little bit from it and we've lost that middle ground that beginning phase that allows that tells people like you know what take a few risks not all of them 
see where you go, learn from it, and then keep taking the risks that seem to be more fruitful rather than mm. the ones that weren't. But as you say, all you see is polished articles. So I think it's very daunting to think yeah. that to take a risk is going to end up, you, you know, you're going to run off the edge of the cliff because you started walking. Yeah, and it's the same with like, people get stuck in people's highlight reels. Like you said, they see the polished version, but they don't see how small risks were started before. And now they're taking massive risks because they're using all of the stuff that they learned through this. Like I've taken massive risks that have flopped before, but if I didn't mm -hmm. take that risk, I wouldn't have been where I am now. And I wouldn't be in the position where I can do what I can do now because I know what went wrong last time. So if you don't try anything, you are failed anyway. Because when it comes to the point of like, for instance, um, when you try and get a home loan in New Zealand, Australia, you get, your credit rating score, right? And in yeah. fact, what happens is that your credit rating score is worse if you don't take out credit. So if you don't it's go and put here. things on HP, if you don't go put take risks on, because in a bank size, you have no actual ability to uh, to show a bank that you have any credit because that you've actually taken no risks in your whole entire life. So in fact, what the old school way of thinking was is that you sit in a classroom, you get told what you should do, and then you spend 70% of your life doing something you hate for a job and which money that you just assume that is yours. But I guarantee you those people that spend the 70% of their lives to only end up on their deathbeds regretting everything they possibly did and also say, what if? Realistically, what we should be taught in our foundations when we're little, when we're, you know, those um, infant stages of our lives, primary school, intermediate, high school, we should be told that your main job is to make sure that when you are 70, 80, or whenever we leave this earth, you have the op option to say, I have nothing to regret, or you don't say what if. I think the most terrible, like the two words that I dread the most when I'm old is what if. What if I took that risk? What if I had that conversation? What if I went on that flight? What if I spent that money that I didn't have at the time, or I did have at the time, but I wanted to put it into a savings account? You've also got to realize, guys, the people that are listening, is that your savings accounts have got such a low interest rate, and the bank will spend the money anyway. Right? I'm not going to sit here and give you financial advice, but if you're looking at it from a logical point of view and you're trying to invest in yourself, you're more secure than a bank is because look at the current events. Some, some of my friends lost five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 overnight because they put, the, they put their livelihood in the hands of someone else. And I always tell everyone, especially you guys, if you can control majority of the decisions that you make and or the controllability of your life, you're going to be in a much more better state than if you put things in an uncontrollable environment, which is what most of um, what most of what we got taught as kids, or I got taught anyway. But it's it's crazy, yeah. and, and and it flows on effect from there. Yeah, it's the same over here. We've um, my dad, obviously, he's tradesman, plumber, like got loads of friends and that. He said he's had friends that when they went to go and find mortgages because they'd never they'd always dealt with everything in cash never any money and now you know had all the money in the world all the savings turned up you could yep. literally buy half the house outright but because they never took a phone contract out no credit score no nothing but yep. all, yeah these low level risk stuff like i mean nobody has an issue taking out a, a, a phone contract that they know they're not going to be able to pay like i've seen it people will go and you know take these low like these stupid risks like oh yeah i mean my oh yeah my phone bill is like 60 pounds a month and like you don't earn 60 pounds. No, no, yeah, but it'd be fine. It'd be fine. Like that seems to be fine. Yeah. And then other things, it's like with relationships, isn't it? It's like those people that they put all their eggs into one basket with a girl or a guy. They mm. got her emotionally and now, bah, that's it. Barren wasteland. It's like, you, you know, if you, you can't, if you put yourself out there, you are basically allowing yourself to be vulnerable enough to get a bad reaction. And you have to do mm. that. You, you only learn at the point where things are just difficult enough where you have to catch up to it. You can't learn anything where you're safe. You no. can't. You know everything yeah. there is. There's no risk. There's no danger. So by going in a, in a new relationship, you put yourself at the edge where you have to learn how to deal with that person. If you're venturing forth, like for us as personal trainers, you go into a different niche area that you, it's just difficult enough that you don't know everything. So you have to move up into it. It's no different than when you talk to your kids, when you talk to your kids, you speak to them in a way that's just more complex than they can understand, so they have to catch up to you. You don't keep dumbing it down, otherwise they never talk. And we, we, we're fine doing that in those things, and I think we need to take that mindset and go, it's okay to be uncomfortable a little bit, because you'll grow into it. And then, you can, and then it doesn't become uncomfortable anymore. If you've been on a diet before and it went wrong, 
you you need to understand you know and I, as we said before sometimes people aren't being as honest as why i had to rant on my instagram story the other day because i saw this stupid women's health article about our diet our newfangled diet that will help you lose 10 pounds in four weeks and it's like it's the mediterranean diet no it's not it's because you put somebody on 1150 calories a day yeah because it's high in probiotics no it's not it's because you put someone on 1150 calories a day we could go on and it's like you you're you're putting yourself out there every time you're getting stung but you're not learning from it so therefore you just regress back and i think that's the biggest thing it's like if you keep making the same mistakes in the nicest possible way that's you you are not learning what you're screwing up on and you you owe it to yourself to just take a second and go why do i keep screwing this up because i keep moving down different avenues but the same thing keeps happening well i'm missing a trick and then once you are able to self-analyze and do that the risks become less scary because you've actually learned from the last one you took hmm. yeah i guess that we could kind of vouch for that one yeah. from similar places but i mean for me like when it comes to taking a risk what i have to think about is like i guess what the situations would be like if i didn't if it makes sense so like especially with like business and stuff like that um i get really anxious about losing money i think after having so many issues in the past like i lost so much money last year on like events and talks and courses that literally got me nowhere at all like literally nowhere so i think having failed so much in the past is a reason why people do get anxious about doing it again because it costs money still to invest in the PT and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's probably a good reason as well. I don't know. I, I agree. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what, I'll expand on that because that's a perfect point because we spoke about this, didn't we? And mm. from that point, we spoke about this with IFS, didn't we? Because we weren't sure what ticket yeah. to get. And I said, now realizing that most people are saying the same damn thing taking matt's point reinventing the wheel you know we're just going to run ourselves over with it that's what we're going to do with it and it's like why do i need to invest again you made a good point saying ah but there are some people out there that you haven't heard of that would be really worth listening to great Mm. perfect point with yourself you spent loads of money last year on all these events but you've learned from it because we had this conversation, didn't we, before? Like you said, I'm going to sell my ticket because actually it's not worth it for something that I don't know I'm going to get a return on. You've learned. So you've done the right thing. You, you assessed. You went, you know what? I did it. I scattergunned approached it. I took all these risks. But I've learned that actually, if it's going to put me in a worse financial situation, it isn't worth going and doing it just yet. And this is yeah. the trouble. I think you're the next stage on. Whereas a lot of people quite rightly, and you are right, again, it's that fear of knowing that because they've screwed up before or they had, they made money and they've lost money, which it usually boils down to money more than anything or confidence. They had confidence and got taken away again because they hadn't learned certain things. It's, it's a very muddy area. You're, 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 I 100% agree with you, Alex. That that's it. It's like knowing what you can lose is just as strong a factor of knowing what you can gain. And you've got to decide what you want to do, I think. You've got to decide... Are you going to focus on what you can lose or learn from what you can lose to make sure that when you put yourself into a new situation to gain, it's a, just a little bit more thoughtful, right? I mean, I've done it. I, I went and, you know, we've blown money that on things that turned out to be useless. And I've gone to seminars that I've just thought, you know, I could have literally read this in a book and it's not worth it. Yeah. But at the same time, that just makes you wiser to the next time and going, well, actually, you know what? I'm listening to his stuff and I've heard it before. I don't need to go to that one. I'll go do this one. Or I've read that author's stuff. And you know what? His books aren't talking to me. I'll go spend 40, 50 pounds on another book. So yeah, I think there's a lot of people in that camp and you're completely right to bring that up because there's a lot of people going to be sat there listening going, well, I've, I've, I've lost so much before. I can't afford to do that again. But on the other side of it, it's like, yeah, you have. And that's a horrible situation to be in. But if you're going to keep dwelling on that, you're just going to keep losing out because you're going to stall. And I'm a perfect example of that. It is again, as we've spoken before, I didn't put my prices up for six years because I was so scared that I was going to lose everything 
that in the end I was losing out anyway because I was only, I was spending less time with the, my family. I was spending more time burning out and my clients in the nicer possible way, they, they didn't know that they were, but they were dictating what I was doing because I didn't have the nads on me to take a chance and go, you know what, I'm just putting the prices up to where they should be. You are welcome to come along and stay with me. Also, I'm not going to work past this time. And everyone went, yeah, all right. Now, I'm not saying that happens because it doesn't always happen. But at the same time, I would be no better off had I not taken that chance. So I think sometimes you, you, you do have to dip your toe and see what happens, but just be prepared that it, it could go wrong, but you're, you're prepared to deal with that, I suppose. Yeah, and it's like with my event next week, it's, lo it's looking highly likely like I'm not gonna sell the ticket. Um, and my friend's saying, well, you might as well come still then. And I was like, well, I've got to pay for like a hotel going up to London. It's going to cost me money. It's going to be risk of the coronavirus, you know? Um, so, <laughs> um, I was like, I'm okay to lose the 95 pounds because if I went, I'm still going to pay like another hundred quid on top of that. So it's just worth sometimes taking the hit and not wasting your time and doing something that's a bit more productive in my eyes. But now I've learned. Yeah. yeah, and but that, that's perfect sense, isn't it? The the people, oh, well, you, sh you might as well go because you got the ticket. No, because I'm still not going to be better off if I go. I'd rather take a ninety five pound hit than spend another two hundred pounds because it, it's never just a hundred pounds in London, is it? It's like you've got your night, and then it's like, well, we'll go and do this, we'll go and do that. It's like yeah, I was at it last time. <laughs> yeah, fly fly B went under over here because of dwindling sales coronavirus gave it a knock so my flight to newcastle that i'm going on on third was supposed to be going on thursday took a hit now i have re i've lost that money because by the time i get the damn money back from the banks and everything else i'm going to probably get about 20p for my troubles after everyone's taking their slice so i really i just thought right i really need to go up there and learn this stuff and meet with these people for various reasons so i decided it was worth it and spent a little bit more money to get back up there it's the same situation you're in but my risk reward was greater than yours. So you made the right decision by going, you know, it's not worth spending that extra two, 300 quid for something that I'm not going to get anything out of. Whereas for me, I'm like, I need to get there. So I have to reinvest some more money. Yeah. I guess it's just take it, assessing the situation. Yeah. It, it, it's and cons, all yeah. that. Definitely. Um, but it's also relative though. Like we get so trained that we, uh, how many times have you gone out for a meal and it's been absolute trash? How many times have you gone out and bought a product and got like Apple care or insurance for it when you actually didn't, because you're already paying for contents insurance, which already covers your product, which you don't need to then spend the 40 or 60 pound of, of getting that much money. So like if you calculated, if the people listening go over their whole entire bank account and calculate all the little expenditures that they bought because, and were not happy with, it would calculate to the same relative percentage that let's say you spent a money on a PT and didn't get any results. It would be the exact same. But the problem yeah. is it's so, it's so connected because your emotions are involved that you don't realize that the money spent is only caused um, more trauma to that person because they didn't get the outcome they thought they were going to get. Now, this also is the problem when you have PTs and gym owners and coaches not giving clear guidelines on the results that that person should expect to get. There is a very big line in which coaches sometimes almost always cross over and they think money before results and money before a person's sanity or money before a person's respect. Now, you know, you sit down and say, well, I'm actually happy as a business owner and a coach to lose money from clients not coming on board with me if they don't believe that they're ready to do it right now. Because long term, it costs me more money anyway. They don't pay me. I have to send them off to get the money back and all these other things because they're the ones that opted into it. Now, people see that two different ways. They say, oh, I'm not going to go and chase that because it's, uh, you know, it's not nice for that person to go through it and it's not worth my time. But actually, at the end of the day, they were the person that decided to do it. Now, as an owner and as a coach, as a, as a client as well, if you're going to go into something and there is those situations, you need to be fully understanding that you have to forego the next four weeks, five weeks as a transitional period. I don't think a lot of people give that time enough value. So for instance, you go to university, you go to college, you go to something, you're going to study. You're not going to learn everything in the first two weeks. 
So then why do clients come to PTs and then expect they're going to get 20 kilos loss in the first two weeks? When has anything been that relative to success? All of a sudden, then they're not guided by the results metric. Like they're not saying this is where you should see results, not this is when you should expect it. Like people expect results in two weeks. I tell people it takes six weeks. Although it doesn't take six weeks, it gives them that buffering time because I know they're going to have a breakdown within the first six weeks. I know they're going to have issues coming up and I know they've got lives. Right? They're not robotic like we are. They don't just have one thing to focus on every single day with our businesses. They have families, friends, loved ones, work, college, food, all these things that are so many variables that we cannot control. So in fact, you could almost say it's 50-50. There's coaches there that let their clients down because they're so emotionally involved in the result they're fixated on. The coaches only focus on the income that they can get or she can get or he can get, that they're not realizing that in fact, that money is not really anything more than what you're already sitting at anyway because we're taught that we need to go and get the full amount all up straight away we're then all automatically disassociated with that person because of the fact there's no connection anymore right and also it's a lot more stressful for that person to then go in and say okay well if this fails i've literally got nothing now if they say if that someone says that's me i'm like okay well that's not a good fit that's not going to work this is not going to work long term if you're saying to me that this is going to be a position in which you're investing everything but or almost certainly at that point there's scarcity someone can never work from scarcity that person then needs to be walked like the amount is completely fine they can completely afford it no one goes into a room and can't afford something that's the baffling thing that i talk to coaches all around the world with it's like you get on a call i get on a call with someone they're like my clients can't afford me i'm like no they can afford you because they get in the room with you if they get in the room with you they can afford it we're not, we're not, we're not kind of, we're not pets. We're not animals. We're not, like, we're not leaded down this road by ourselves. And we know that fully. We're not getting a, a person by the neck and get putting a dog collar on and pulling that person into a consult room. That person is going in there with the intentions to change their lives. Now, if they say they can't afford it, it's because they're not emotionally involved enough with the transaction. And if they say they're not getting results, it's because they may actually not get results, but is it because they're fixated on something that isn't tangible? right? They say, oh, I want to lose weight. Well, that's tangible, right? The number can always change and we know that. They don't know that though. There's not enough education with the consult process or the communication process that they need to be walked through. Like a female cannot lose weight. You know, for instance, you get, I, get preg I get a pregnant woman coming to me last week saying, hey, I want to use your app. And I'm like, cool. And she's like, oh, I want to go on a, a diet. And I'm like, well, you're already in a calorie deficit, right? You're breastfeeding, you're doing all these things. And she's like, oh, no one's ever told me that. And I'm like, how many PTs have you had? And she's like, like five. And I'm like, it's a simple thing, but they don't say that because they want the money. Right. And yeah, I know course, the fact, yeah. you know, every, every business owner needs income to survive. Right. So it's not about a question about, do you want the money or not want the money? That's not what I'm saying, but you need to have the audacity to sit there and say, okay, well, actually this is probably not a good time for you. Come back in two months and then come back to me. That person's a hundred percent going to come back to you. So you can like both ends, a client cannot work from scarcity and a business owner cannot work from scarcity. Otherwise nothing will grow. Because if you're yeah. in, a, in a state of scarcity your whole entire time, when you're looking over your shoulder, worrying about the bills coming out, you've got to realize that there's something else, there are, there's a bigger problem than just your weight loss or just your health. There's mental side of things that we need to focus on. There's all these other things that we need to focus on. And as PTs, yes, we need to stay in our lane, but you can also provide information about, okay, well, what really is causing you to work from the scarcity? Call them out on it. There's not enough trainers sitting in consult rooms calling out clients, vice versa. Clients are not calling out PTs. Just because we have personal trainer beside our name does not mean you cannot be called out for what you do. Yeah. Right. Yes, there's a hierarchy and yes, that we study for this long. But again, how many times do you go into professions like uh, doctors, nurses, um, waiting rooms and question why things are happening? Why is my daughter not being seen? Why is my son not being seen? Why is my medication not being topped up? Those questions can be asked to personal trainers. We are not God. Just because we work in a gym and we you know, we work out and we, we live really good lifestyles and we are younger than most of our clients does not mean you cannot call those people out. Because the more that they get called out, the more trash that will get eliminated from our industry. There's thousands of PTs. In fact, one of my years uh, when I was in Dunedin, 200 PTs started that year that I left. They just graduated, 200 PTs. I guarantee you 5% of those are actually decent. The rest were just, I left a, I, I can do a bicep curl. I'm going to go charge someone that much money for it. Yeah. The problem is I when think... you get trainers that go in and charge so little, people get let down so often that when they say expensive, they just assume that they're just money hungry. 
they don't just assume that the results are guaranteed. They, you yeah. know, you get, you get access to a lot more different things. You get access to us individually for longer because if we're charging more, we don't do nearly as many sessions as those people charging less, which means we can go over, you know, calls, we can go over texts, we can go over all these things because we have the time, the energy and the emotion to connect with that person. So in fact, the more money you spend, the better result you're almost able to get because that person's going to spend more time with you. But again, question things. Why is this price this way? Why are you priced at this price? Why is this happening? Why am I not seeing these results? Don't just expect things to happen. Don't just get beaten up because you don't see a number increasing or decreasing. Question it. Hey, my weight's not going down. What's going on? You're the professional in this job. Why are you not doing a job? Just say it in a polite manner. Don't just come at people and say, oh, I'm not getting results and see you later because that's not going to fix the problem. If you've invested money, you're going to lose it if you leave. Yeah. So why not have a conversation like you would with your bank? Why the hell did I lose $5,000 out of my KiwiSaver? That same conversation needs to be happening with personal trainers and clients and gym owners. Hey, I'm paying $7 for a gym membership. Why are you not open at this time? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? Oh, that's a different membership. Oh, I didn't know that because no one had a conversation with me. Don't just expect things to happen for you. Nothing is, nothing is free and nothing is ever going to be as easy as it looks. But again, if you're willing to sit there and spend $20,000 on an education, but you're not willing to spend the same on yourself, something's not adding up. Yeah. Um, and with the whole asking questions, when with my online client, when she, she came at me and she'd had a crap service before she'd signed up paid up front got all the information given to her received a whatsapp message once a week or you know a couple of times a week and she was like i just lied because you know that that's that that was all i got so when i was in the process i was like look you have got questions and she and she was um and ahhing she wasn't sure and i you know i'm not going to put a hard set on that's not who i am i said but you've had a bad service from somebody in my industry. Now I know who the guy is and I don't rate him very much, but it's one of those, you know, you get enough people in front of you, somebody's going to get results that you can then multiply. Mm -hmm. But I said, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to think of everything that went wrong. I want you to ask me every single question you've got, talk to your husband, talk to your friends, talk to your kids, talk to whoever you need to talk to, to think of these questions and come back and fire them at me. I want you to grill me because I am confident that I can give you something better than he hasn't. And then she initially turned me down and I, and she was like, you know, I know you're the right person for me, but I'm just 50, 50 right now. And I, and I said, if you're 50, 50, I don't want to work with you. Not because you're not because I'm refusing. You. I said, but if you're not hundred percent into this, there's no point. I'm not going to chase you. I'm not going to try and give you stuff that you don't have. And then she didn't see her. I said, no, I'm in. Because I just, I, I, I affirmed that she should have all these worries and risks and that we should be very honest with one another. And she was fine with it. And then on the flip side, there was a guy that came and spoke to me the other day saying he wanted to build up muscle and stuff, but he was also training for a triathlon. I said, buddy, no. I said, you're not going to come and train with me right now. So that's no good. I said, you wanting to pack on muscle right now is going to make it a hard damn job for you to run this triathlon. So I sent him a swim program to help him with the swimming for free and said once you've got the basics down and you know you can run this then come back and talk to me i was like there's no point working with you now because you're going to get you're you're going to be training with me and going my triathlon's getting worse well i ain't training you for a triathlon buddy i I, i'm the worst person you want to talk to about that at best i make your swimming better i'm definitely not going to make your running better because i look like a seal out of water when i run so i definitely can't make you do it and yeah it just is again it was like this isn't going to fit because you've already put your expectation out and I know damn right that I'm not going to fulfill it. So I'm not going to put myself in that situation. I did this beforehand in one of the first gyms I ever worked in. A guy came up and he had money in his hand. He was going to put it in my, ha- in my hand. And he said, I want to train to run a marathon. I went, you need to go talk to Darren. He's ran seven of them. And he went, what? And I said, I'm not, I'm not going to do this with you. I will make you worse. I don't want to put my name to this and one risk putting you off training make me look like a damn idiot when there's a guy that I work with who is waiting to get you where you need to go. And he was like, oh, wow, nice one. He gave him, I gave him to Darren, instant, you know, 280 quid in his hand. But then all of a sudden, you know, if you look at it from a business point of view, I showed that integrity and helped out another trainer who knew that I had skills that he didn't have. I received two more clients off him. So it worked out. Like, don't be afraid to say, look, this is not my wheelhouse. I'm not putting my name to it. It's, no, it's like trying to ask a carpenter to come in and do your plumbing. He's not going to do it because it's not what he does. 
Mm. So, what are the strongest, I think, sentences you can ever use as a PT towards a client or any kind of service based industry is, why do you want to work with me? Try and convince you, it's their job to convince us to work with them, not the other way around. And it's also that you could also ask this from a client to a PT point of view. Why do you want me as a consumer? Why do you want me as a client? Because if you don't have these conversations and you just move through like a cattle of cows, then all of a sudden, if you don't have that connection, if you don't have the emotion, if you don't know why these people want to work with you or why you want to work with this personal trainer or why does this personal trainer feel the right to work with them, then nothing's ever going to be working. Nothing's ever going to be there. Because if you can't find out that information, like they run a marathon, like they do a swim, um, like they're, a, you know, effectively, you know, might have been unstable in a position where they're just leaving work, they're going to a new job, they're, move, they're going on holiday. It's not a right fit. All that does is cause tension and then vice versa. What's the bigger result? You quit your PT job because you've got unstable clients in terms of irregular sessions, irregular payments. Um, they're going on holiday all the time. They're moving around. Unfortunately, that's our fault as, as PTs and you've got to take credibility to that. If we don't have a screening process, if we don't have a way to, you know, weed out all the people that are not ready for us, then all of a sudden, all, yeah, we may get 20 or 30 sessions every week, but then all you're going to do is say, hate your job and hate what you do. And then all of a sudden you spent 70% of your life hating what you do. So just like you picking a job, make sure you pick trainers based on how you feel as individuals and vice versa. Pick clients that fit your model and don't be afraid to say no. Don't be afraid to push people away because yes, I understand. I work with people that are in financial situations where they relatively couldn't afford to do that. But can you afford to bring on a bad client when you have no clients at all? Right? Because all you're going to do then is put more stress on an already stressful environment, which means then you're going to make bad decisions because you're working out of scarcity. And then all of a sudden everything tumbles over where if you just waited, turn that person away they may even conform and say, actually, okay, well, I'm going to go away and you know, invest in two more months of your content. They're going to become a better client. They're going to become a better individual. And most importantly, they're going to respect you more for it. We're such a yes society. We say yes to everything because we're worried about our, over our shoulder, you know, bills coming up, holidays, houses, dogs, cats, family members to pay for, right? But in fact, it should be the other way around. You should make smarter decisions because you have the option to say no. Because not every person is going to be the, the right fit for you and not every person is going to be the right fit for the, the, the individual going to a gym. But the best thing you can possibly do as a client going into a gym is have six sessions with six different trainers. Right? I had one of the most amazing clients back in, back in the day when I was in Dunedin is that she literally did the same thing. She went around six different trainers and then I won because of my personality and the way that I did the session. Not because of my knowledge, not because of the the price she didn't give a shit about the price remember you're personal before anything else so your yeah. personality will always out trump knowledge power and income right so there's no point if you have an amazing personality you should be charging more if you have an amazing knowledge base but a shit personality maybe you shouldn't be charging as much because those people are going to be in a minimum of what, what 30 weeks with you that's nearly ha over half a year right so yeah. if you're going to spend half a year with an individual, the conversation has to be made, right? Don't care about price because price is untangible and price is irrelative because the same price will be justified on numerous different expenditures over the next six, seven months of your life, but you will not have the same thought. You'll probably say no to a personal trainer at $70 an hour, but you'll go to a movie because it's gold class and spend 40 pounds, which in relative is the same, if not more expensive than that hour session. Yeah. So, you know, vice versa, if you're not willing to invest in the client experience and the client satisfaction as a personal trainer, then you've also got to look at yourself and say, am I putting my price up because I think, you know, or I want to earn more money or do I think that my experience is becoming better and better and better, which if you're a year ago, it should have, if you're six months ago, it should have. That's why every six months trainers need to look at their price and say, am I undercutting myself? Not undercutting myself in terms of money being made, but the experience that is then being taken away from my client because I'm cutting my prices down, but increasing my sessions. If your increased sessions go up, but your price stays the same, your client quality will automatically always go down. You cannot function at the same rate that you were if you have more people coming in at the same price because something will give and it will never be, the, it'll always be the client experience. And unfortunately, it most likely will be the, the person trainer's health. That's why 80% of trainers fail. 
they go in there and they say, I need to pay gym rent. So I'm going to go the cheapest possible way. And I'm going to do 50 sessions, 60 sessions and just smash myself into a wall. But they, at the time, they don't have any time to spend on their business. They're always in their business. Don't worry about yeah. upfront payments versus payment plans or whatever. Don't worry about PT prices when you walk into a gym. Just do something that is going to get you the results the quickest way possible, but in a way which is not going to jeopardize the experience for you as an individual. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the biggest problems I came up against in the beginning was that I, and I don't know what it's like out in um, New Zealand when you are, but I know there are, there are certain gyms out there, health clubs more so, that use personal trainers as a means of gaining revenue for their gym. Mm. And by doing so, dictate your worth for you, depending mm. on how many hours you've done. And having been in that situation, I think it breeds into you. And I think that's why it took so long for me to get out of it. It breeds into you that you've got to take people on because your income is based upon how many sessions you can perform. They don't care. You know, I, I'd said this before because... Um, you know, I was like, my worth isn't determined by how many sessions I perform. It's determined by how well I do that one session. Mm. And the gym was like, yeah, well, that's great. But if you do less than 36 sessions a month, you're only going to get paid eight pound a PT and tax taken off. Then if you earn up, to, if you do over that up to 72, you get 12 pound a PT with tax taken off. If you do over 72 hours a month, you make 16 pound a PT were taken off but the trouble is the only way you get that is if you sign the ticks off so you the trouble is you i got caught in this trap where i was taking on people that i probably shouldn't have worked with that weren't a good fit that were flaky because i needed to make sure i had this bumper amount of sessions then all of a sudden they're not turning up and i can't get them i can't get the money for that session unless they sign off that they turned up which they're not going to do if they didn't and my money, when I literally, I dropped one person underneath because they were ill, and all of a sudden my monthly intake plummets by, you know, seven, you know, almost over a couple of hundred pounds. And it just breeds into you. And it's a shame because it's the gym that did it. It was the gym strike, not the PT. The PT knew, it, I knew my worth, but it was dictated by somebody else. And my advice to that case is if you are in that situation, you get the fuck out of Dodge. Just get the hell out because you are never going to breed good habits when somebody else is determining what you're worth to make them money and it's a shitty pro process that needs to be massively dropped but unfortunately that is but then that was my fault because i was very naive coming in it was my first proper gym job and like you said i wasn't asking these questions i was like your gym do what you want i'm just happy to be being a pt for you know after spending time in a hotel gym folding towels i wasn't asking the question like so how does the pricing structure work you know, you, but you are essentially the client to the PT, which is the gym. So as a PT to a gym, I'm like, I should have been saying like, well, how is my worth determined? Well, you know, we're going to, we'll, we'll pay you a certain amount, depending on how many sessions you do and depending on what pack you sell. Right. So I'm doing all the selling, I'm doing all the PT, but you're deciding how much of that I take. I should have walked. I should have just seen this red flag, but I was just so happy that I'd got a job in an actual gym that I think the miss comes up. And I think that's the same with PTs, uh, with clients, isn't it? Sometimes they just get so, you know, they've seen a PT that they like or, you know, oh, he seems really friendly. They haven't asked any questions and they're just so wrapped up that, oh my God, I'm getting a personal trainer. This is going to be such a good experience for me. And then all of a sudden it turns into a massive flop, but they're stuck. And they don't, that sunken interest, and oh, well, I've already put time and effort in and, you know, I'm sure I'll get the results soon. And like, we, we all should have walked away when we found, when those alarm bells started ringing, but you don't because you just say you've already invested a little bit into it and you feel like if you pull out now, it's that whole, as we said before, it's, I know where I was and where I am now and I'm afraid I'm going to go back even though I'm not actually making any progress, but I know how bad it could be, so I'll just stick where I am. But it's also relative though. I, I don't understand the thinking of when people get in the mindset. I think this is also because people get so intertwined of, you know, for instance, if you, if, if I fail in the next month, I'm not going to go back. I'm just going to stay where I am because the failure is not effectively losing money. It's just losing potential money that would make you go further. So if you yeah. think about it, like if you lean forward and the first foot that goes out in front of you is your dominant foot, right? If you continue to do that every single day, then you're already making steps towards something bigger and better. But the problem is we're so laid back in the which we just expect things to happen for us that all of a sudden we assume that we're moving back, but it's relative. Are we moving back or have we just lost out on moving forward? 
Uh, we just need to roll the dice again to see if we can move two or three sets spaces forward. Or at the end of the day, are we really going back is a question that I want to ask people. Are you individually going back or are you overthinking it, causing yourself to think you're going back, but actually in reality, you're just staying where you are? Because if you're a personal trainer that's doing 20 sessions and you miss out on the five sessions that you could have got that week, you're not, fur you're not failing, you're not decreasing, you're actually just staying where you are. And you should know that no matter what, no matter how good you are, you're always going to have churn. You're going to have two or three people probably leave every other week, if not every month. So if you can account for that, if you can understand a system, you can understand numbers, you know, for instance, a hundred a hundred consult, a hundred leads will get you 20 consults, will get you three clients. If you understand numbers, then all of a sudden you take control back. However, like you said, if you get in the gym state of mind, if you don't know realistically the same reason why gyms do it versus advertising, you've got to cover your cost per lead somehow. So that's what the gym do. They're spending money to get people in the gym. So of course they're going to counter out themselves rather than PTs because 80% of PTs fail just because you're bright eyed and you know, bushy tail doesn't mean anything to them because they've seen thousands of ones before. So the energy should not be there to impress people. It should be to impress yourself. And this is where yeah. I think trainers and clients need to be super selfish. We get told we shouldn't be selfish. We should look after others, not when it comes to our individually individual mental health and state of mind. It should always be fill your own glass first and then worry about the rest later. Right. In the morning, yeah. you fill your bowl of cereal up before any other motherfucker gets up because you need to eat before anyone else does. Because if you're hungry, how are you supposed to provide for anyone else? It's like you watch, you watch animals and they're completely, utterly the same way. The male or the female, the one that's the oldest, will always eat first. Because it's the hierarchy of things. If they can't defend their herd, then their whole entire cubs, they spend nine or six or however, however long it takes them to produce cubs, right? Don't even know all of that hard work is gone because if they can't protect their herd, they're dead. So what yeah. I'm saying to personal trainers and, and, and clients, if you can't protect yourself first, there's no point doing anything else. That's what you need to work on. You don't need to work on losing weight. You don't need to work on going into a gym because you think it's the new thing. You need to work on why you consistently think that you can't protect yourself first. Why are you giving out 90% of your energy every single day and only receiving 10 back? That's not a fair trade. If it's your job, leave. If it's your relationship, leave. If it's your friendship, leave. Because it's not you that's causing yourself these mindset shifts. It's actually other people. If you surround yourself with five negative people, you will become negative. I don't care how positive you are right now. If you're in a relationship which you dread to go home and you're sitting in a car, get out of it. I don't care if it's a marriage. I don't care of how many kids you have. Those kids will notice every single thing anyway, so you're already too late. Why not save the rest of your life? Because when they grow up, they're going to remember all of those situations. So be that person that can inspire other people as well. If you want to go into the yeah. gym, realize that there's going to be trainers that are going to be shit. There's going to be trainers that are going to be all right. And there's going to be trainers that are great. Those trainers that are great are going to be really, really hard to get into their model though. Because they already know that those cheap trainers will fail you. Those mediocre trainers will fail you. But you've got to pay to play. Simple as that. Get out of the mindset that everything is going to be free. Everything is going to be cheap. Just because your local 2-4 is doing a 2-for-1 deal doesn't mean you can go to a gym and get the same deal. Yeah. Right. How I many said, times um, have you... No, you could go. Uh, so I, I, I did a couple of posts on this recently and it was like 100% of zero is still zero. Like if you, if you, from a parent's point of view, and I've said this to a lot of the mums that I work with, that... Everybody expects a piece of you. Your kids need a piece of you. Your spouse needs a piece of you. Your job needs a piece of you. Your friends need a piece of you. Mm -hmm. Well, you need to make sure you're as close to 100% as possible to give as close to 100% as possible. If you're, if, you're, if you're giving away everything apart from yourself, but you're not giving yourself anything back or taking time to recharge, you run on empty all the time. And then you feel bad because... Oh, I don't give enough to my kids. Well, have you taken enough time to recover to give more? Well, no, well, then there's your problem. It's not because everyone's taken too much. It's because you didn't turn around and go, whoa, whoa I, need to, I need to recharge. I need to restock the log pile before I start burning more wood. And the other one was scaling or taking things away from you is not giving yourself more. So when people, yeah. like, as you said, people get in a situation where I, I've had it and I, I've had it recently where I had, Four clients leave for ver three clients leave for various reasons. I was down a thousand pounds a month, so I have two options: either A, 
start scaling my spending and my lifestyle back or figure out how the hell I'm going to get that back. And if I scale my lifestyle back, I'm not giving myself more because I've actually given myself less because I'm now learning to live at a lower means rather than going, hang on a minute, no, no, I had this. I need to get myself back to where that is and then get more so I don't fall in the situation. Hence, thanks to Alex, I got in touch with you and we're now in this situation because I now have processes in place where I feel more confident. If someone leaves me now, I'm like, right, I'm not going to think, oh shit, Beth, right, no, don't go out, don't do this, don't do that. I'm like, right, no, I need to move forward. I can't keep taking things away from myself to keep myself safe. I've got to keep thinking forward. Like, because as you said, if you don't eat first, if I'm the alpha, the head of the household, if I'm not covering me, nobody else gets covered. And I can't have that happen because then the whole thing falls apart. It's also, if you don't have a system to follow, like I, I can't believe how many trainers I talk to that don't have, you know, especially in gym trainers and they're like, oh, you know, I only look for clients when I don't have clients. It's like, how many, how many businesses continually, continually run ads? How many ads do you see for businesses that are always running ads for new yeah. stock and new leads and new things? There should never be an off switch when you're a business and or a personal trainer. Just because you're fully booked doesn't mean you stop losing the clients. In fact, if you're fully booked, you're underpaid. You should never be fully booked. There should always be room for more people because there will always be people leaving. And when you have the op option to not care about people leaving in terms of like getting really affected emotionally and stress, you know, stress related, not like, I don't care if you leave or not, that not in that mentality, then all of a sudden you eliminate all the problems that you were facing before. Because if you have a surplus of something, you're fine. You can always pull on it later. You can always create different packages for these people. If you're fully booked, do semi-private PT. Get four of your clients into different groups, charge $27 each, you're making what, $108 in 45 minutes? Yeah. Right. Pretty simple, right? Stop saying you're fully booked. It's not cool. It's not like you're at a boys club and you're measuring your dick because you're like, oh, I'm fully booked. You're not fully booked. No, that probably person is probably living a better lifestyle than the fully booked trainer. Because that fully booked trainer can't do shit if he leaves or she leaves. Take the trainer out of the gym, you're screwed, my friend. Right, you can see it now with the coronavirus, all gyms around New Zealand, especially all trainers messaging me, all my mates that are still in gyms, they're stressing out because all their clients aren't coming into gyms. They haven't got any terms and conditions. They don't have any online platform. I said this five years ago. I said, when I started, I wanted to be online in five years because of this exact problem. When you take things like gyms and you take things like uh, you know, gym rent and gym leads and all these kind of things, you're putting your own sanity in someone else's hands. Same mm. with clients. I'm sorry, but you're obese for your own issues and your own problems and your own result. We didn't force you those Tim Tans down your throat. We didn't force you to go down these different roads. And you've got to be a reality check with that as well and say, if I own the fact that I got myself in this position, I can get myself out. And that is the best thing you can possibly say to yourself every single day. Don't get upset because you're overweight. Who fucking cares? No one is looking at you because of your weight. Everyone is looking at you based on who you are as a person. I don't judge any person based on what their appearance looks like. I judge people on how they uh, act around kids, how they act around dogs. That's the two variables that I measure people on, right? Because those, you can't fake that shit. A kid crying and you get really angry, that person's an angry person, right? So you've got to also I, I look at- I don't know, I'm going to interject there because I mean, there's only so much crying you can take as a dad sometimes if we have to go outside and lose your shit a little bit. <laughs> but Yeah, but you go outside and lose your shit. If you lost your shit in front yeah, of them, that's a different story, right? So, so it just shows a yeah, lot about a person. But you're also a parent, like I'm saying, if you met someone's oh, kids. Yeah, I'm exempt. I don't, this rule doesn't Wait, apply. Alex, Alex yeah. is going to chime in a second. But what I'm meaning is that you got yourself in that position. No one made you yeah, I really not did. able to get yourself out of that situation, right? Like how many, pieces, how many situations have we been in that it's our fault that we got into it? It's our fault that our clients left. It's our fault that we don't have any leads. It's our fault that we got ourselves in financial position we got ourselves into. Well, quite frankly, there's only one way we can get out and that's doing it ourselves. But ourselves means, can we go to someone else that gets it out faster? Not doing it yourself and going down to the local, you know, to, uh, local you know, park and doing your own workouts. That's not time efficient. That's going to get you a negative return because you don't have as much time. If you can go to a PT and do three times the amount in half an hour that you could do in two hours, it's always a positive situation. If you can go to a business coach and get told what you should and shouldn't do in business, it's going to save you money when you don't have any money. The amount of people that say, oh, I can't come to you because I don't have any money. That's fine, but you're still going to not have any money next month. 
but in next month I can have you more money. Right? Yeah. So it's a situation that you can have with your clients. Those objections that clients have, you should expect have you should expect to have objections from your clients. If you can't deal with the objections, you don't have a business model. Because if you're going to sit there and say, oh, I want to find the clients that don't object, they don't exist. That's not a real person. I go into every store and say, is that the real price or is that just an upsell? I can buy the real price, but why would I buy the real price when I can get a discount? Mm, right? That's true. It's so crazy. You're that guy. You're that guy. <laughs> well, I, it doesn't, I don't even care. People are like, why do you always do that? I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but if you went in there and could save $30 that you can then spend somewhere else. It's always a good example, right? But at the end of the day, also, what you could say as a personal trainer is, or as a client, if you're having a bad experience, there's only one person that can change that. It's not going to be the PT because that person is the one that's having the bad experience with you. Yeah. If you're going to other people and expecting better conversations, you're wrong because they don't understand your situation. The only person that's going to understand your situation is you. And you can make that final decision. Even if every single person tells you to jump, are you going to jump? Probably not because you're already going to think about it again and again and again and again. If you want to fall forward and commit into that program, it's only you that can make that decision. And if you need some more time, that's fine. If people keep haggling you and saying, you have to do it now, you have to do it now, probably not a good decision. Yeah. Right? Let your clients and let your trainers and let yourself come to these results in due time. Do not expect yourself to lose weight in the next 20 minutes and then blame the trainer because you didn't lose weight when actually you were the one that went out every weekend, but then felt like you had to lie to your trainer because you were too embarrassed to say that you did that. Mm -hmm. Whose real situation are we in now? Like it's a, it's a pretty easy example to do, but yeah. All right. So what are we going to finish on? Final thoughts. Coronavirus is just the flu. <laughs> oh <laughs> controversial <laughs> fast forward but I, I do everyone's. i do kind of completely agree it's like you know i i've actually had sars and i've had swine flu so i'm like come at me like what what's another one i've beat the, do you the think though ones. do you think the only reason why it has exacerbated to it has is because social media is now more powerful than when that was around oh yeah yeah definitely like you think you know there, there's a doctor saying yes it's serious but there's clear signs if you have them don't be a dickhead sit in your bedroom and treat it like the flu that's fine but then you've got fucking sally on social media oh, i just bought 600 new rolls and 12 gallons of hand sanitizer i'm going to marinate myself in every 20 minutes so i don't get the virus you should do the same otherwise you can't come near me nobody wants to come near you anyway you're an asshole stay in your home do you know what i've had recently with massage is so you wash your hands before and after the massage and that's standard yeah. in it since that's like, like the first thing we got taught was basic hygiene and i had a client this week going oh is that because of the virus you're washing your hands i was like are you fucking serious i've done this every single time <laughs> no like, i'm just not a dirty oh. bastard <laughs> exactly i was like i'm not suddenly washing my hands like every, where do you think i like fucking walk out the room to go like what you can put your price up and say it's include uh, if you want if you want to wash your hands before and after it's another 10 pound <laughs> <Yeah>. someone's <laughs> messaged me and said that um they lost four clients yesterday because of the coronavirus in one day. Speaking and they which, haven't to like back themselves just, up. You should just do a giveaway for your um, ticket and make some leads off it. I actually should. That's it. I mean, I, I've lost one, but to be fair, she is in her 80s and her husband's like 86 and not great. They're my neighbours, actually, funny enough. The lovely people, which she's like, I'm so sorry. She felt really bad about it. So I'm going to miss the gym. I was like, yeah, you need to stay at home. Like, don't worry about it. If you need things, I will get those for you. Like, you, you stay the hell inside. But I'll send it but, through the post because I'm not going to touch you. <laughs> yeah, and, and at the same time, at the same time, if it feels a little slimy, it's because I've hand sanitized myself and the package before I gave it to you, just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's not going to be good, is it? As I said um, before you jumped in, it, it's bred two types of people, hasn't it? You've got, as I said, you've got the people that are going to be like, oh my God, stay in your homes, hoard Lou Roll and tinned vegetables, like morons. That You know, you do realise that we, we've been doing pretty well for the last 12,500 years with cooking food to kill stuff on it. Your coronavirus is not going to attack a cabbage. Shut up. Um, 
And there's the other people that are like, whoa, whoa, I'm going to go out anyway. I don't care if I got the virus. Like, you are just as big a ball bag as the hoarder person. Like, if you have the virus <laughs> or symptoms, stay the hell in your house, you massive asshole. If yeah. you don't have the symptoms of the virus, stop hoarding loo roll. It's, the world isn't going to fall out of your butt. Your brain might, because it's already heading that way anyway. But just chill out. Like, let the, the smart people tell us what we need to do not the social media knobheads that are gonna laugh and sensationalize everything so but that's the dangerous part now i think the real problem is is the incubation period though i think it's different to the others i think the incubation period is longer than the other two that's affected it that's a problem like like people two weeks yeah so people are like oh i'm fine and then all of a sudden the back end they're like then feeling bad but realistically they didn't see the signs earlier on which means they had two weeks around people which i think is the problem and because we're such a narcissistic society now everyone just denies the fact that there's something wrong because they don't want to be vulnerable and they don't want to be wrong most importantly no one in this world wants to be wrong where back in the day I don't think anyone cared if they were wrong, but because everyone's like, Oh, I don't want to know. I don't want to have it because it's embarrassing or it's because, you know, I might give it to other people. I'm just going to say, I don't have it. Blah, 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 blah. When actually you do again, the selfishness. Yeah. I think, I think for a lot of people as well, it's like, I mean, for me personally, I do very much have it instilled into me from my dad that you don't have time to be ill because you've got to go and provide for your family. Mm. And that's, it's a dangerous mentality. I mean, in the nice way, when I had swine flu, when I had swine flu, I literally had it for a week before I went to the doctors. And I was like, I went in there and at one stage, I thought I had meningitis because the symptoms of swine flu was I was sat in my living room with all the lights turned off watching TV with sunglasses on because the light hurt my eyes that much. I didn't go to the doctors. In the end, my mum was like, I'm going to make you an appointment. I was like, all right, fair enough sat in the waiting room for 40 minutes with all these mouth breathers, which was delightful. And then the doctor was like, oh, yeah, sounds like you've got swine flu. Can you leave out the back like some unclean peasant? And I was like, I've had it for a week. And you, 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 you feel a little bit bad because your stupid mentality is like, I'm fine. I'll just suck it up and deal with it. And then you're like, yeah, to be fair, I've been around people for a week already. I could have just like infected the world. I'm like patient zero now. And... But I think at the same time, because we don't have protections in place, because statutory sick pay is so shite in this country as well, you, you just have it in your head. You, you, there's two types of people there, people that are sick every 20 seconds for no reason, and people that are just like, I mean, I've gone to work with my lungs full of fluid from an infection I got, literally white as a sheet and shivering, because I had three clients left that I wasn't going to let down, and then spent two days shivering in bed. So like, I've got the worst mentality when it comes to illness. I'm like, I'll go home, have some homemade soup like Nana used to make and I'll be fine tomorrow morning. Whereas some people are like, you know, there's a fart in the air and they go and run for the hills. Yep. Yep. And there's people like me, it's like cheap flights. <laughs> <laughs> we see ya. <laughs> Let's go Bali, fuck it. 